author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Hello and welcome to Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's special show, we're talking politics, the Second Amendment, and drug regulation, and a whole lot more. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American Constitution. Is democracy in peril? Is the soul of the nation on the brink? That's what we're going to find out today on Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio America Network from your flagship station in Washington, D.C., WWRC. And we're joined by none other than longtime host of this here show and Liberty Nation senior political analyst, Mr. Tim Donner. Tim Donner, soul of the nation, in peril or not? Your thoughts? Well, I think people on both sides believe the soul of the nation is in peril. On the Republican side, the Trump side, the MAGA side, the conservative side, the soul of the republic is threatening to be poisoned and stained by the most anti-democratic uh, movement we've seen in a long time, which is the pro-Hamas, mm. anti-Jew protests on college campuses. And let's call it for what it is. It isn't just anti-Israel. It isn't just pro Palestine. It's anti-Jew. These are movements that want to wipe Jews off the face of the earth, and we need not mince words about it. So that is the most blatant threat to democracy. It has easily supplanted January 6th as the so-called democracy issue in this election, as far as most voters, I think, are concerned. Uh, Tim, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that a, a lot of people, not me, but a lot of people would argue back that just because they are not, you know, just because they're not supporting Israel in this battle, uh, that that doesn't mean that they're anti-Jewish or that they're pro-Hamas. However, uh, I believe it was Douglas Murray, the British author, and well, let's call him polemicist because that's pretty much yes. uh, a, a good way to look at what he is. Um, great, great mind him, but he, he points out something similar to this that, uh, and forgive me, Mr. Murray, if you are listening and I paraphrase this incorrectly, but if you were, for example, if you were supporting one particular issue and that issue was supported by neo-Nazis who wander around in Nazi regalia and you could say, and would you try and make the case that no, 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 I'm not supporting them. I'm just supporting the same cause as them. Now, how comfortable would you feel doing that in polite society? Well, not Probably very. not so much, right? <laughs> not very. Um, and I think, that, you know, it's important to point out, too, that these, these protesters, these rabid anti-Semites who are basically shutting down one campus after another, Columbia has canceled its graduation, it's ruined its reputation, which it had taken really since 1968 to rebuild. And now they've thrown it all to the to the wind because of their refusal to stand up to these savages who are threatening Jewish students, doing encampments and a beautiful quad there, the whole thing. Um, I think when the issue of democracy comes up that the left loves to say that Donald Trump is a wannabe authoritarian, that he will be a dictator on day one, which he teased them with. And of course, as usual, he did something basically tongue in cheek and they took it and ran with it with a very serious reaction to dictator on day one. The problem with claiming that Trump will be an authoritarian is that this is a guy who's already been president for four years and Americans can see what he did and did not do in office. They saw how, as a matter of fact, even in the midst of the Russia collusion hoax, which was one of the most cruel hoaxes ever perpetrated by a political party, 
in America. He still didn't lash out and throw people in prison the way that Joe Biden is trying to throw him in prison. And yes, let's just say it, Joe Biden. Did he order Fonnie Willis and did he order uh, Letitia James and the rest of them to try and throw Trump into prison? Probably not. But he didn't need to. Mm. They all knew what the marching orders were from the top, and it was unspoken, and now it has it has exploded back in their faces like an unexploded ordinance that they just stepped on. And they honestly, Mark, don't know what to do about it except try to buy off voters. Yeah, yeah we spoke about that in the last uh, episode. Now, it's funny, you say... Um, that they're worried about him being authoritarian. They are. That they, that there's a, um, Robert De Niro, the actor. Uh, he was recently on. Uh, I think it was a, it was some late night talk show, talking about this guy's going to be a Mussolini. This guy's going to be a fascist. He's authoritarian, and uh, the whole world must have been sat there thinking. But we saw what Donald Trump did. And Donald Trump, if conservatives would have one complaint about Donald Trump. It's that Donald Trump, I think, kept getting rolled over by the courts. And every time he tried to do something, he would get shut down in the courts and therefore have to scrap it. That's not what an authoritarian does. An authoritarian steamrollers, steamrolls those courts. He and doesn't basically back breach, down and look for another route. And, and breaches the law of the land for his own personal purposes and yeah. to consolidate his own power. Uh, so... This whole issue of authoritarianism, again, this has just faded out like every yeah. other Biden failed attempt to convince the electorate that he should have four more years. You know, I'm going to point out again the irony of all this, Mark, because I've said this before. Joe Biden could have been a hero uh, for the Democratic Party after he took Trump down in 2020. And then the party held on and did better than expected in the 2022 midterms. He could have could have stepped aside then and been given all manner of tributes for old Joe. He took down Trump. He got us, you know, back into the White House, et cetera. But instead, by carrying on and insisting on a second term, which was never part of the deal, never part of the deal. He has now destroyed his reputation because he's probably going to lose to Trump, which turns him from a hero to a villain in the Democratic Party. Very Just talk so. to Hillary Clinton about what it's like to turn from a hero to a villain overnight. Again, that with Hillary Clinton, same as with Joe Biden, it's all self-inflicted damage. Yes. You know, the basket of deplorables, semi-fascists was Joe Biden's basket of deplorables. And he just, yes. it seems that he just doesn't understand that this guy who claimed unity at least 16 times in his inauguration speech is doing little but dividing the country with that kind of talk. I mean, it's the kind of irresponsible rhetoric that Donald Trump was accused of for four years in office. But I mean, it's, picture yourself as the average voter mm. who likes to watch the presidential inauguration every four years. And Joe Biden comes on and uses the word unity or the equivalent like 16 times in his inauguration. And, and they see months later on July 4th, he stands in front of a blood red fascist looking backdrop and calls anyone who voted for Trump a danger to the nation, semi-fascist, mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically... How confused must that average voter be? He said, well, wait a minute, he called for unity. And now he's becoming more divisive than any president in American history by, by demonizing half the voters of the country, which, by the way, is not a terrific electoral strategy. It, it won't go down as one of the best in the history's playbooks. Now, Tim, finally on this topic, I just want to pull back to the idea that so many people have been talking about this is a danger, it's the, 
the death of democracy. Democracy is on the line. And you, you spoke earlier, and, and this kind of brought something to my head that I've just noted down here about why they're using that kind of language. And, and it seems to me that if they were saying the constitutional republic is is on the line, well, that's you know that's that's a sensible way of speaking about what the nation is. But by using the very word democracy, it gives it a lineage. It gives a, a history and a provenance, if you will, all the way back two and a half yeah. thousand years ago to ancient Greece, Athenian democracy. It's essentially what they're saying by using the term democracy rather than the constitutional republic. What they're saying is the entire history of Western civilization is on the brink if you don't cast your ballot correctly in this election. And it's it, it's almost like subtle propaganda to try and tie everything that we value, the art, the culture, the history, the languages, into one thing and say, this man, this would-be president, this former and would-be president, could destroy everything that has been two and a half thousand years in the making. Well, it's thoughts a nice on that, try. Have I gone too far? <laughs> It's a, it's a nice try by the left, but I think one of the principal reasons they refer to democracy beyond your excellent observation there that it puts a historical root on it is that, frankly, progressives don't really believe in the Constitution. They don't like to refer to us as a constitutional republic because they don't like to be constrained by the Constitution. And thus, if you think about it, when you look at the kind of things they try to do with a one vote majority uh, in the Senate, right, what they tried to do was pack the Supreme Court, add left wing territories on as states so they could get more electoral votes. Um, they tried to do things that are the true threat to democracy. They don't, they don't like the Constitution. They want to get rid of it. And I think that's the reason that they refer, among other reasons, to democracy, because it does sound like a big, long historical project to restore in a way that only Joe Biden can restore it. But if you think about it, Think about where democracy will be if Joe Biden wins. Okay, look at the dominance of progressive culture and progressive politics in this country. If we affirm as a country the riots on college campuses, the open border, the inattention to crime, the hollowing out of cities, if we see Joe Biden for another four years, those trends are only going to be doubled down. And the idea of new states and packing the Supreme Court will be alive and kicking again. Tim Donner, thanks ever so much. Pleasure, Mark. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. And we're back with Tim Donner. Thanks for sticking around. Now, Tim, I want to... Just very briefly, if we may talk about the upcoming conventions, we have the Republican National Convention in July. We have the Democrat National Convention in August. What do you think we can expect from these? What will be the highlights and the lowlights of each one? Let's start with the Republicans. Well, I think the Republican Convention is going to be a coronation for Donald Trump. Nothing more, nothing less. I mean, this is his third consecutive uh, nomination for the presidency. The last person to do that was William Jennings Bryant in terms of someone that won or lost in three consecutive elections. So, I mean, he has taken over the Republican Party, which you would expect for a guy that's the nominee of the party three consecutive times. The Republican Party has become an America first party. And I think the people at the convention will reflect that. I think I expect it to be pretty much a love fest. I think that you will have some disruptions from the anti-Semites who are running roughshod on campuses across the country. But well, I, I think mean, they're going to they're going to save most of their ammunition, so to speak, for the Democratic convention. That's exactly August. what I was about to say. 
Uh, but Tim, at the Republic one, do you think we'll have uh, the announcement of who Trump's VP pick will be? Because it's traditionally they speak on the 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 vi- the person on the vice president's ticket speaks during the convention, right? And so Mike Pence yes. wasn't announced till just before, I believe, uh, in 2016. I, um, if I had to guess, I think that Trump will make his selection or will announce his selection the week before the yeah. convention so that people have time to sort of get used to it and start, you know, spinning his credentials, his or her credentials, um, and, you know, probably have them appear together before the convention starts. And then uh, the vice president will be the probably the most interesting speaker at the Republican convention, because in effect, this is the most critical decision going forward because whoever Trump picks is going to automatically be favored to win the nomination in 2028 since both Trump and Biden can only serve one more term. What, one more question on the Republicans there. Uh, I, I, I know who I think. I think I know who it's going to be. Would you care to give your guest just one name? I'll give you mine. You give me yours. Well, I haven't settled on one name. Okay. You I really haven't. I, I'm, I'm too conflicted between the bona fides of a guy like Tim Scott who could help with a black vote, with a, someone like a Christy No, uh, who could help with a woman's vote, or, or a Tulsi Gabbard who could help both ways. Um, it's, I think, you know, a Tulsi Gabbard would be a really good pick outside the box, attractive, uh, very articulate, uh, reformed Democrat who became a Republican. Um, I'll just say I think that would be a good pick without having any knowledge of whether he's seriously considering that or not. I'm going to put my pick out there. And uh, if anybody agrees with me or disagrees with me, do get in touch with LibertyNation.com. But I'm going to put my cash on J.D. Vance. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Democrats. So the the convention's coming in August, and you think uh, that the anti-Semitic mob riots are saving their ammunition for that event? Well, let's put it this way. At a recent meeting of over 70 anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli groups that are probably central in organizing all of these protests across the campuses, funded in large part by George Soros, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, supporting the organizations that are sponsoring all of this stuff. Um, These groups have a, a sort of a rallying slogan, which is, let's show the Democrats, let, or I'm paraphrasing here, but let's give the Democrats, a 1968 Mm. style welcome for the convention in Chicago in August, which means, and these people are very well organized. They've got, you know, they have leaflets, for example, on how to break into a building, how to talk to police, how to avoid arrest, et cetera, et cetera. They know what they're doing and they have big plans for genocide Joe, as they call it at the Democratic Convention. So it could be a real bloodbath. And 1968, I think the only thing that prevents another riot-torn convention like 1968 is the memory of 1968 and how the Democrats were brought low by that convention. Tim Donner, thank you ever so much for joining us. Always a pleasure, Mark. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The Joe Biden administration is proposing changes to regulation on marijuana. What impact will that have across the country? What impact will it have on legality across the country? And, of course, on people who are already in prison for marijuana-related offenses. We're very fortunate to have with us Liberty Nation's legal affairs editor, Mr. Scott Casenza, Esquire. Scott, thanks for being here. Cheers, Mark. Always a pleasure. So, Scott, what is the Biden administration proposing? Well, this is one of those uh, 
I guess trial balloon is how you say it, uh, where they don't actually have the proposal and and release it or implement it. It's just they've released to uh, friendly media outlets their intention to change the regulation. That's what we have so far as we record this in front of us. Um, statements that they will move to change the classification. Right now, marijuana, you know, we have a federal system. So there are state laws about marijuana and federal laws about marijuana. And federally, you may not possess marijuana, even though you can go to stores in a majority of states, I think now in the United States and purchase marijuana or marijuana products. It's a federal felony to have even one joint worth of marijuana. They just don't prosecute it. And that's the system that we've been living in uh, since the Obama administration, uh, when they changed the rules to allow, you know, Obama had um, gone harder against marijuana than uh, President Bush did. It was kind of remarkable uh, that people thought he would be more tolerant of uh, the federal posture with respect to marijuana prohibition than the, the previous Republican president. And he wasn't. He was much worse. And then they got pushback. And I think maybe it was uh, before his I have to check the timing on that. It might have been before his uh, first re-election or his re-election campaign that they did this. But they made a, a memo that basically said as long as people were uh, obeying state law with respect to marijuana, whether that was using it or selling it, then they weren't going to be charged federally. And that's the system we've been living under ever since. Uh, there was talk for uh, people may recall Jeff Sessions, uh, Donald Trump's attorney general, was a uh, vehement uh, anti-marijuana crusader and wish to return to full-on prohibition and federal criminal prosecutions for all manner of uh, marijuana uh, uh, crimes. And that was stopped by a Colorado senator, actually, who refused to advance any of Donald Trump's nominees for any office if they continued with that practice. And that sort of put the cap back on, on the bottle. And uh, marijuana is scheduled federally at it's on what's called Schedule One, which is actually, a, I think it's a Food and Drug Administration uh, schedule, which says that it has zero, no medicinal value whatsoever. And so it cannot be prescribed. And then when you combine that with the federal criminal pro prohibition, you know, basically there's no valid legal reason to ever have it. And the remarkable thing is some drugs that are widely seen as much more abused and deleterious to people's health and society are on a lower schedule. So cocaine, for instance, is not on schedule one. There are medicinal uses for cocaine and it can be medically prescribed, but but not marijuana, even though we have a nation where millions of people take marijuana, not just for recreational or non-prescription purposes, but for medical purposes, whether it's CBD stuff or, you know, uh, as a appetite stimulant for those who are, have wasting diseases and things. It's used medicinally all over all the time, right? But is forbidden from, from doing so. So essentially it's a, it's, it's a federal law at present without teeth, federal regulation at present without teeth, without enforcement. And so yes, if- So it's a federal regulation that the president can change at his will, basically. But you know, they go through a lot of talk. Yeah. And I, so I, I, I don't mean to cut you off there. I just wanted to say for people who don't know, there's lots of talk about, well, these, re, you know, we're reviewing the regulations or, you know, the idea is that this is somehow arrived at by like officialdom or smart people and scientists and things like that. It's not. It's simply a political choice. They can choose to make it schedule three if they want, which would mean it would be widely available uh, via prescription or keep it at schedule one would, to make it completely forbidden uh, from possession. So I just want to get clear. So if Joe Biden and his administration determines that this has to be, well, this will be further deregulated at a federal level. What that means is that the states that currently, currently don't have essential legal pathways for marijuana, they would then obviously not be obligated to do it because you're not forced to do no, anything. It's a feature but, of our federal system. They wouldn't have to do anything. Okay. So, but they could, if they wanted to, without having to go through, uh, some kind of loopholes to comply with federal law in terms of, for example, in terms of banking. No, and things they, like they this. don't. They, well, OK, so that's the big benefit. But the banking thing would change, for instance. So right now, these a lot of these dispensaries are shut out of the banking system. Uh, they 
oftentimes can't take credit cards. They can't have bank accounts. Uh, you could make a case, too, that um, a, an administration that wanted to frustrate their uh, success could lean on banks that give like mortgages even to the properties that they occupy, right? All these places don't own their own real estate. Uh, most retail stores rent, and that's true for most of these places. Well, they could go to banks and say, hey, you're a federally chartered bank. You can't have a tenant that is committing federal felonies literally from the moment they open until the moment they close. So the kind of normalizing or normalization of marijuana businesses will be or would be a big feature for, and it wouldn't be total, by the way. It wouldn't be like, okay, now we're completely prohibited and now we're okay because it, it won't change the law, Mark. This is just a designation in the Code of Federal Regulations, which gives the executive the power to schedule different compounds uh, and schedule means place them on schedule one two three those are the, the the kind of main brackets maybe there's four as well which i think is uh over the counter otc medication so that's where the change will come okay and will there be any impact on people who are federally incarcerated for drug crimes i don't think so because at the time you know, there's a very small set of people that are incarcerated on federal marijuana charges. That's that's a, a rare bird. Um, and if they were, if they broke the federal law at the time they were they were you know alleged to have broken the federal law, if they if you later change the federal law, you don't get a get out of jail free card uh, because the thing that you did is now not a crime. Um, if you did it and it was a crime, unless Mark. There could be some ruling from a court that it was inappropriate that it was ever a crime, but that's not what we're talking about now. Now we're talking about the regular uh, kind of political order of the Democratic wheels turning and the ruling is it's, this is no longer going to be, you know, forbidden. Well, let's talk. You mentioned the word political. There. Let's talk about what's the political benefit for Joe Biden here. Oh, Yes, that is. I mean, we I think we buried that's the, the lead, the probably, issue, Mark. Right? Yeah, th that is the whole issue. Um, and I know that uh, Tim Donna wrote about this for uh, for Liberty Nation and and talked about it uh, as a, just a sop, uh, you know, a, a last ditch effort to to kind of bring along some some folks that aren't in support of uh, President Biden. And, you know, you have to think that for the eight years of the Obama Biden presidency and we're now deep into president biden's term in office we're you know coming up on the halfway mark uh on year four uh of his presidency and yet now is when they've finally uh decided that they're going to do this and of course they haven't actually done it which could have been accomplished in a day they could have actually just done it there's just talk about doing it which is sort of, you know, not even the full measure of, of what's been done. But yeah, it, it seems like it is, you know, call me a cynic, Mark, but but gee, it just seems like this is not about uh, redirecting policy to accord with the wishes of Americans. And Americans have made their choices very clear on this. It's no small margin that people don't want their neighbors to be thrown into cages or using and consuming marijuana. They do not want it. Um, and, uh, you know, it may be a political win for Biden. You know, there's a healthy way to think about it too, Mark, which is that that's how democracy is supposed to work, which is even though Joe Biden is an inveterate drug warrior who has an unquenchable thirst for throwing Americans into cages for all manner of things, especially, you know, uh, low income blacks through his crime bill that the political process is forcing even the, the great drug warrior, Joe Biden perhaps to uh to reduce his uh you know stridency on the issue and and if he can swing a few votes for the 2024 election well that that's all just coincidence again scott we'll be right back with you after this short break don't go anywhere we dismiss history at our peril liberty nation radio with mark angelides with the election in november many voters are looking at what issues matter to them and for many americans the second amendment 
issue is one of the biggest that's going to be effective of their decision. And we're very fortunate to have with us Liberty Nation's editor at large, Jim Fight, who happens to be knowledgeable on all things guns and gunsmithing, rather interestingly. Jim, thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark. Yes, that's right. I know everything about gunsmithing and guns in general, uh, except for the, the things that I don't know. Except for those, the unknown unknowns, I believe, yeah. a Rumsfeld uh, <laughs> quote there. So, Jim, I, I want to kind of get a, a a view from however many thousand feet that particular saying goes. I believe with inflation, it's now a lot higher. Uh, yeah. But a, a view of gun rights in America over the last few years, how they've been impacted, uh, whether there's been an improvement in protecting Second Amendment rights, whether there's been a decrease. And now, of course, a lot of people may be thinking about this segment on the radio show, thinking that we're going to be talking solely about what Joe Biden's done. But I think the reality is, Jim, that the president really hasn't had much of an impact. And rather, the, the main stories have been with regulations in court decisions and things like this. Does that sound about right? Yeah. And, and, and it's definitely been a mixed bag, you know, from a big picture point of view, it's been, it's definitely been a mixed bag. I suppose the, uh, the ATF regulations you can put on Biden since that's an executive branch agency, but yeah, I mean, on the, on the flip side, you've got the Supreme court rulings and other various court rulings, but like the, the Bruin case, which completely re uh, restructured how we have to view laws based on the second amendment, um, which is good for the Liberty side. Uh, because it makes it harder to ban guns. Then there's uh, that so-called bipartisan Safer Communities Act that passed under under, under Biden's leadership. It did, didn't do a lot. It kind of touched some of the surface level things in, in Biden's anti-gun plan, like uh, raising the minimum age to buy so-called assault weapons or enhancing the, uh, you know, they couldn't get that per se, but now, but okay, but now if you're under 21, you have an enhanced background check. Uh, which just digs deeper and looks at other things like um, mental health stuff, I think, mostly. But yeah, it's it's certainly not for lack of trying, though, Mark. He's he's certainly tried to get things to pass, but you've got those pesky Republicans and 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 uh, Supreme Court justices that just keep getting in the way. <laughs> keep getting in the way. Now, you, yeah. you mentioned that uh, there's some efforts to make it harder to buy guns, and there was a really fascinating poll, and you wrote about this on the pages of LibertyNation.com. It's a really fascinating poll by Rasmussen Reports, who, mm -hmm. for, for my money, and I, I'm, a, I'm a dedicated poll watcher. It, it's, it's pretty right. much 80% of the things that I write about on LibertyNation.com are, are examining polls and what's behind those polls. And so for my money, Rasmussen Reports is it's, it's, it's a top-tier polling organization. In fact, 2016, they're pretty much the only one that nailed it absolutely right. Uh, the, the presidential election. But they had this poll out um, that you and I have discussed and you wrote about. Uh, and there's almost a, a slight deficit in the questioning, but that's because of the nature of what it is. And they, they surveyed uh, a big bunch of people about whether they thought it was uh, too easy or too hard to buy a gun. Now, you really deep dove into this, Jim. What did you find? Yeah, that that poll. I, I'm I'm with you on that. I'm 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 a big fan of Rasmussen uh, reports, but they uh, they kind of flabbergasted me with this poll because of what I would call their baseline question. Um, the big the big headline question was that 49 percent of respondents thought that it was too easy to buy a firearm. But sort of from my perspective, their baseline question, you know, have you or anyone in your immediate family bought a firearm in the last year? To which 80 percent responded no. So only 20% of the people that we get this 49% from now that has, has bought a gun in, in, in the past year. That doesn't mean they don't own guns. It doesn't mean that they haven't, you know, that they've never bought a gun it just means that the other 80% has, uh, has not bought a gun recently. And then of course you can dig down because that question, because it's sort of a, a dual question, right? It's have you or anyone in your immediate, in your immediate family, so, so it's not even that 20% of these people have bought a gun. It's that 20% of these people have either bought a gun or yeah, somebody else in the house probably did. Yeah. It, it, it makes the, the sample size. And that's really the point of the article that you wrote that. Uh, right. Yeah. Their, their total sample size was like 1200 and some change, but 80% of that's like a thousand people. So you got like a 200 person survey is really what it comes down to as far as, uh, 
people who have a recent experience with buying firearms. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And then, but then, of course, just to play devil's advocate on this, there's also uh, a number of people who might respond to a casual question about whether they purchased a firearm or a family member has by denying it. Yeah, I, I, figure, I figure your yeses are kind of your middle-of-the-road people. Your, your yeah, we bought a gun in the last year are probably the people who have either bought their first gun in the last year or, or they've just, you know, they, they've only got a couple of guns. I almost guarantee that guy with 20 guns in the basement did not answer yes to that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pretty much where my mind was going on that. Yeah, so let's talk about that. <laughs> Is it harder now to buy a gun than it was, say, 10 years ago to buy a firearm of any description? 10 years ago, uh, may, maybe in price. Okay. As far as actual regulation, I don't think it's really any harder. Yeah, I don't think it's any harder than it was 10 years ago, other than it's just more expensive. Yeah, it, it, it does seem that um, a lot of people's understandings of what it takes to, to get a gun, to get a gun license, a firearm license in many places, um, which has certainly changed somewhat, the, the firearm licensing part. Well, that's the true. The licensing Bruin. part has changed. Uh, the Bruin decision. Yeah, it, it seems that there's a big push for a narrative that you, you can buy uh, a firearm as easily as you can buy a soda. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that does seem to be the dominant narrative in the big box media. And, and from my understanding, Jim, that's entirely false, isn't it? That is, well, I don't know, man. Uh, I, I guess it depends on if you want the... Uh... If you want the original Coca-Cola recipe with oh, the yeah. cocaine well, in that, it, there you go. Right? Yes, <laughs> buying a gun is probably easier. Uh, <laughs> or, but uh, but no, I mean I've I've never had to fill out an ATF form to get a soda, so sure. or have a you know have a criminal background check for a soda. And there, there's this uh, recently in the media. There's been this um, discussion about closing the uh, gun show loophole which i'm fairly sure actually never existed there was no such thing as a you could and and i mean you could call it a gun hole loophole you can call it whatever gun you want it's not a thing uh, yeah, it's a, a gun hole loop uh, show <laughs> yeah yeah no there's this there's this uh there's this idea that uh and, and that's that's the most i'm going to give it credit for is just that it's an idea that uh that like oh you can go to a gun show and buy guns without a background check uh, what well, they're trying the paint the picture they're trying to paint here is that like oh you know there's just these unregulated people they've got you know they pull up in a van and set up a table and you know you go in there and buy a M60 machine gun you know th no background checks but uh, but that's just I mean that's not how it works you you can sometimes find some really cool guns at gun shows sure but <laughs> but under federal law you're either a licensed dealer or you're not a dealer legally right and if you are a dealer without a license, then you're a felon, <laughs> you know? So they're essentially trying to do away with something that is non-existent in the first place and only perpetrated by criminals. Why haven't they thought about this with regards to other crimes? If they, if they regulated murder, I'm sure the, uh, the, the homicide rate would drop dramatically, wouldn't it, Jim? I know. Right. And, and yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's crazy some of the things that uh, that that people actually will believe, um, and and if and it's not all narrative. I mean, some there are actual lawmakers who believe some of this stuff. You can you can definitely tell when you when you watch their their little videos and listen to their sound bites. But but overall, for for all that Biden has tried to um, quote unquote end the gun violence pan, uh, epidemic, he uh, he hasn't affected a lot of change. And that's something we should be thankful for. <laughs> well, that, I, I guess, proves the enduring strength of the United States Constitution. You know, it's almost like there's a Constitution. Yeah, it's almost as though, right? Yeah. Jim Fight, thanks ever so much for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. And that's just about all we have time for on this week's edition of Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network from our flagship station in Washington, D.C. I've been your host, Mark Angelides. I'd like to take a moment to thank our guests on today's show, longtime host of this here radio show, Mr. Tim Donner, Scott Cassenter, who joins us as always to talk liberty, and Jim Fight joining in for a special discussion on gun rights in America. And of course, I want to thank you, the listeners at home, for taking the time to join us week in, 
week out. You really are appreciated. Thanks for listening. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.